Please pray with me. Gracious God, we seek your spirit this day. We listen for your word. Move among us and help us to hear you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. In 2011, the St. Louis Cardinals won the World Series. Yes, I know Cubs fans. Cubs have won the World Series since then and been much closer to the Cardinals ever since. But that postseason was a thrilling one as a Cardinals fan, with many come from behind wins and multiple postseason series that went down to the wire. I still remember multiple games from that postseason. But it was also an unexpected one. After the World Championship, several Cardinals players and the retiring Cardinals manager all but called out parts of their fan base and certainly the local media, calling them in effect doubting Thomases who didn't believe in the team and their ability to win until almost the very end. And they were right. There were doubts, and many of them, many, many, many doubts about the 2011 St. Louis Cardinals team. And the uncomfortable truth is those doubts were well founded. The team played poorly during many stretches of 2011 and had to earn the wild card spot through which they went through the playoffs on the very last day of the season. And even that because one other team collapsed, losing their last six games. There were indeed many doubts about the 2011 version of the Cardinals, and those who doubted had good reason. Just like Thomas had good reason for doubting in our Gospel lesson this morning. Since we have read this, this text year after year after year, every week on Easter too, you've probably know, heard by now me say to you that I think Thomas gets a bit of a bad rap. After all, he's not alone in doubting the resurrection when first told about it. And his doubts don't and should not define him any more than we call Peter denying Peter. But I must acknowledge that he did have doubts. It's clear in the text. He did not believe the words of his friends that they had seen the resurrected Christ he didn't believe what they told him and had questions. However, much like those who doubted my favorite baseball team in 2011, his doubts were well founded. Why should he believe his friends, those first disciples? What had they done to show that they had indeed seen the Lord? When this passage opens, after they've heard the good news from Mary Magdalene, they're still in that upper room, still sitting there, waiting behind locked doors and afraid. Now, in the beginning, it's still Easter, so it almost makes sense. After all, they didn't believe Mary anyway. It makes sense that they would still be huddled together in the upper room, still living in fear. But by the time they tell Thomas, by the time we get to the end of this morning's passage, it's no longer Easter Day. It's been a week. And yet, they're still in that upper room. They're still hiding behind locked doors. It's been a week, and their excuses have run out. They have seen the resurrected Savior. They have seen the Lord. And yet nothing in their lives show this. They don't even get the excuse that the disciples do in Luke's Gospel. In Luke's Gospel, they're said to wait for the Holy Spirit. But in John's Gospel, they've already received it. Jesus breathes it upon them in that first appearance. And yet, 
they're still sitting behind closed doors. They're still afraid. One week later, they're still in the upper room, still huddled in, in fear. Their experience seems to have not changed them in the slightest. So why should Thomas believe them? What evidence have they given for their claim? Why should he think they're doing anything but making up a story? Would you believe them? I don't know that I would. Of course Thomas doubts. But it's not in Jesus that he doubts. It's in his friends and the disciples. Those who have given him no reason to believe through their lives, through their actions, and every reason to believe otherwise. It is the disciples that lead Thomas to doubt and to question. It is all of them who need that second appearance of Jesus to remind them to go out and live what they have seen. It is all of them, including Thomas, who need to respond to this second appearance of Jesus by living like the resurrection is real and allowing Easter to make a difference in their lives. And we do too. When I was making notes for this sermon, my initial rough draft of outline, I noted that it was the disciples who Thomas had doubts in, that it was indeed their actions, or lack thereof, that led him to question their testimony. And the very next thing I wrote was this. When have we given people reason to doubt that our faith is real, to question our testimony of the risen Christ? That's the question, isn't it? That's the rub. It's very easy to read this story and see ourselves as Mary, as the one who saw Jesus at the tomb just last week, after all, who goes and tells the good news to a world that is not ready to believe. It's easy to read ourselves into the texts as those that Jesus talks about who have not seen and yet believe. It's easy to criticize doubting Thomas and the rest of the disciples, and make no mistake, they probably need the criticism. The disciples, until after Pentecost especially, really don't get it for a long time. But ultimately, it is we who yet need to be changed by these stories by the Jesus we see in them. And it is we who have at times been found lacking, who have not allowed transformation to occur. So the question is there. Where have we failed to live out the testimony of our faith? Where have we failed to love our neighbors as ourselves? Where have we failed care for the least of these? Where have we acted as if we need to live in fear instead of putting our trust in God? Where have we been those first disciples still waiting in the upper room, still waiting for a transformation that should have already happened? I don't want to try and answer those questions here. There are different answers for each of us, I assume, but they're important to ask, to ponder, to stew over and reflect on. Because you see, the second Sunday of Easter is the day in which we are invited to not just celebrate the good news, to not just proclaim that Christ has risen, but to go out and live it to make our lives reflect that good news. So the question of where we have failed to do so is an important first question. And the second
second is like it. How can we start to do better? How can we move from those who have failed to those who live it out? Once again, there are probably as many answers to this question as those of us in this room, if not more. So I'm not going to try and list all of them. Instead, I want to offer just one answer. It's one possible answer. It's the answer I think is perhaps most important for our time and day, but it's just one. One way that we can do better as those who have heard the good news is to cease living in fear. It's that fear that strikes me when I read the Gospels. The disciples were afraid. They were afraid of the Roman authorities, of the civil soldiers who had put Jesus to death. Afraid, probably accurately, that those same soldiers would have no problem adding to that death toll of putting a few of them also on a cross. It's a fear that is real and justified, but also a fear that the disciples allowed to paralyze them until they were able to let it go. We too live in a world of fear, and we too need to be able to let it go. I'm not talking about anxieties and depression and mental illness. I'm not saying we can't also have you worried from time to time. Or that we just need to stop following legitimate safety practices. What I'm saying is that we need to work to let go of all the kinds of fear that can paralyze us. Because there are a lot in our world. We have fears about our social standing, fears about our financial <coughs> security, fears about the other. And those people, fears that we ourselves are not enough. These fears can paralyze us, and we need to find ways to let them go. Because these fears can keep us from living out the love that Christ offers us. But here's the good news of Easter. The good news of the resurrection. The good news is that through the new life Jesus offers us, we can indeed let go of those fears. We can trust that the God who did not allow Jesus to remain in the tomb can help us find more important things than our social standing. That the God who cares for the lilies of the field and the sparrows of the air will help us care for ourselves, help us find the financial security we need. We can trust that the one who made us loves us just as we are and says to us that we are enough right now, that we are loved right now, and that we do not need to do anything else to earn God's grace and love because God offers it to us all the time. And we need not be afraid. perhaps most importantly in our society today, we can rest in the sure and certain knowledge that life in Christ is not a zero-sum game, that the God who loves us loves the whole world too. And resting in that knowledge, we can begin to see that those around us, and those far away, and those very far away, all children of God and their brothers and sisters. We can begin to see that those who look like us and those who don't, those who believe like us and those who don't, those who are in the United States or who are in Mexico or who are in Iran or Iraq or Korea or China or Russia or South America <coughs> and the many countries down there or anywhere else in the world and even the space station, all of them are beloved 
children of God. All of them are people whom God has called us to love and to see as our brother and our sister. All of them are not an other, not a those, not a people of whom we ought to be afraid, but part of us and part of our man, part of the great fellowship of children of God that we all share. We can begin to believe that and live it out, well, the power of the resurrection will indeed lead to a new and transformed world. Christ is risen, the disciples told Thomas, but their actions didn't back them up. And so Thomas doubted until he saw the risen Christ. Jesus is not likely to come in here today and show us his hand and his side, but we can see Jesus among us we can know the truth that Christ indeed is risen. And as we go to share that good news, to share the love of Christ, may how we live reflect our words so that those who hear us may not doubt but believe and know that God loves them, that God loves us.